Well, good afternoon, and I guess also good evening and good morning uh, to everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Austin Pugh, and I'm the new NECAN coordinator. Welcome to the 2023 webinar series highlighting monitoring priorities for the Northeast. This is the sixth webinar in this series, and today's theme is OA and biological impact. With the assistance of this series and our presenters, the NECAN Steering Committee will be working on the development of a regional monitoring plan for ocean acidification. And these webinars will serve as a resource for them as the plan begins to come together. Updates on the series are shared through our mailing list and on our website. So be sure to check out the website for the full schedule. At the conclusion of presentations today, the steering committee will be asking our panel some questions, and then we're gonna open up to a more general Q&A. During that Q&A session, please feel free to use the raise hand function on the bottom of your screen, or you can submit questions and comments in the chat. First up, we're, we will hear from Brittany Jellison. Uh, Dr. Jellison is a marine scientist that explores how coastal organisms are responding, acclimating, and adapting to human altered environments, including seawater pH and temperature. Her work explores how marine ecological interactions are altered by global change using a variety of mechanistic, laboratory, and field experiments, with a focus on factors that influence and alter trophic cascades in coastal systems. Most of the work done in her lab concentrates on intertidal and subtidal ha habitats and marine invertebrate organisms. Please take it away, Brittany. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to pull up my slides. All right, do you see uh, my slides? Yes, we can see them. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to present at this uh, webinar, um, and thank you for the introduction, Austin. <clears throat> um, so I uh, am going to make a pitch for uh, sort of thinking about the variability of carbonate chemistry in the very near shore, um, especially in sort of intertidal environments, um, and that's been uh, predominantly where I focus my research. Um, and I just wanted to introduce myself a little bit more. Um, I am uh, very new to UNH um, as an assistant professor um, and focusing on ecophysiology. Um, so sort of the physiology and behavioral responses of marine invertebrates, um, especially in terms of multiple stressors such as ocean warming and ocean acidification or coastal acidification. And so I think about these responses um, in terms of individuals um, and their behavioral and physio physiological responses, but also uh, thinking about predator prey and trophic interactions um, and all along um, coasts. So where we see variability in carbonate chemistry. And I just want to say that um, I am fairly new to the East Coast, and so a lot of my examples are um, going to be thinking about West Coast carbonate chemistry, um, but I think it's still a great uh, system to sort of use as an example, um, especially because of the sort of network of monitoring that has happened in the intertidal on the West Coast of the U.S. And so um, I... I uh, want to make sort of the pitch for thinking about that variability of carbonate chemistry in the near shore um, intertidal environment, because I think that's going to be really helpful for thinking about predictions uh, for biological responses, um, especially for economically and ecologically important species that um, make their home in these near shore intertidal environments. Um, and from what we have measured in terms of carbonate chemistry uh, variability in that sort of habitat has allowed us to really map out how thresholds that we measure in the lab um, sort of play out in the field um, where we see variability. Um, and if we actually understand and have monitored that variability, we can determine whether or not these animals are 
living close or near to their um, limits. And then uh, sort of case studies on thinking about how temporal variability, so fluctuations in um, ocean acidification or coastal acidification uh, might provide refuge or accentuate the effects of coastal acidification when it comes to animals living in the near shore. Um, and then also thinking about spatial heterogeneity. So we might find that there are local hotspots um, and that can influence the response of different populations to these changes in the future. Um, and so really in that way, uh, being able to understand that spatial variability allows us to look for local adaptation or um, changes in the environmental history that different populations have experienced. Um, so, yeah, so I um, we we know that ocean acidification is going to uh, be this sort of global phenomenon and stressor. Um, but when we go uh, near shore into coastal zones, they those are areas where we might experience more rapid acidification um, and could provide an opportunity to really think about how these uh, animals that we you know love to go visit and also are economically and commercial um, species are going to fare in a future ocean. Um, and so monitoring these conditions um, in the near shore can really help us make better predictions um, for how these communities are going to cope um, with coastal acidification. Um, and so when we, when we have measured uh, changes in uh, carbonate chemistry in the very near shore, um, a lot of this work has found that there are many drivers to variability um, in these systems um, and that they can cause these sort of latitudinal, regional, and habitat um, trends um, in the variability of carbonate chemistry. So this is um, a figure from a, a great paper thinking about that near shore environment um, and the biological effects like phytoplankton blooms or um, photosynthesis and respiration of community uh, members, as well as the physical sort of processes like uh, freshwater input and mixing such as upwelling, as well as you know, seasonal changes driven by um, radiation can and temperature changes can alter the variability of these uh, sort of near shore environments. And we can get some deal fluctuations um, in carbonate chemistry, as well as some of these regional uh, differences in the trends of pH in this um, figure. And so this uh, is a um, figure uh, from a um, pit, pit, paper from the um, Hoffman lab um, out on the West Coast and um, they are at UC Santa Barbara, um, thinking about all of the measurements um, that we do have at that time, this is, you know, a decade ago, um, for this really near shore um, environment and comparing it to open ocean um, conditions. And one of the main takeaways for me is thinking about this variability. So uh, in the sort of open ocean, we see more stable environments, but when we start to measure pH um, in the near shore, we see uh, these deal fluctuations as well as some seasonal patterns where we can get exposure of these animals to um, some pretty low pH conditions, um, even currently. Uh, and so, the colors are really just different sites, um, but the boxes are showing these different sort of regional or um, near shore processes and um, sites. So, you know, this estuarine location, we see a lot of variability um, in our pH environment that animals living in estuaries are going to be exposed to. I do a lot of my work even closer to shore thinking about intertidal environments. So um, I've measured chemistry in tide pools um, in particular, thinking about how they compare to subtidal or um, near shore uh, conditions. Um, and so when we take this a uh, closer view of tide pools that get isolated from uh, the rest of the ocean um, during low tide events, uh, we can actually get 
really extreme conditions um, occurring for the animals that um, make tide pools their home. Uh, and so here is a comparison of sort of shoreline uh, pH variability on a snapshot of just one day. But you can see here, we can get um, pH here in this figure um, around 7.2, but I have measured pH down to 6.9 pH total. Um, and then during the day when we have photosynthesis happening, we can get pH as high as nine. Um, so they're dealing with some extreme fluctuations in pH. And if we were to just go based on open ocean, um, stable conditions in our experiments, we might not be able to capture sort of how they are dealing with the current conditions with uh, mapped on top of that our coastal acidification predictions. And so being able to actually measure those changes um, and the current conditions uh, really near shore allows us to sort of identify how those thresholds that we, we are able to measure in the lab can map onto the current and future pH variability in animal habitats. So um, th this is a, a picture of Bodega Marine Lab um, where I did my PhD work, um, but you can see uh, that we can measure sort of pH um, in different habitats that different animals might um, find their home. Um, and so these, this would allow us to look at the pH of the habitats that these animals are actually um, experiencing. Um, and then we can use some lab experiments to identify their thresholds. So um, a lot of my work, I, I do sort of functional responses um, of marine invertebrates. And so I expose them to a range of pH levels, um, and that can help us understand where their thresholds lie um, in the particular response. So here is just an example where we have um, on the y-axis an anti-predator behavior. Um, and so a zero means that they're not uh, responding to predators, and a one is that they have a fully realized anti-predator response, meaning that they're less likely to get eaten by their um, predator. Oops. Um, and uh, when we look at this in the lab, we can then look at the 50% um, sort of impairment in that response um, as a function of pH, and that can uh, sort of let us... Um, map that uh, response and think about thresholds. Uh, and if we were to just stop there, we would, in this example, identify this intertidal snail um, as being less susceptible to pH change because they can go to really low pH levels before we see a 50% impairment um, in their response. But if we are able to monitor and understand the variability of the habitats that those animals actually live in, um, we can map that sort of threshold of response like this onto um, that, that pH that they're actually experiencing. And although you see here in this gray line, that intertidal snail can um, experience a little bit lower pH before we see changes in their behavior, they're living a lot closer to the extremes that we do see in tide pools, meaning that even in current day conditions, they might experience pH that, that really drastically alters their anti-predator behavior. Whereas this um, other snail that lives sort of lower in the intertidal um, is probably unlikely to experience pH currently or even in the future that would um, warrant sort of uh, us to, to, to sort of think about their impairment in behavior. Um, and then another thing that uh, being able to monitor that near shore carbonate chemistry uh, can be helpful in understanding predictions of biological responses um, is that it can help us understand the fluctuations that we might expect in the um, near shore environment. Um, and then we can use that knowledge to really create experiments um, that incorporate that natural variability. Um, and when folks have done this in the lab, um, what we see is that uh, oftentimes we can get accentuation of um, impaired behavior, impaired um, responses um, in these invertebrate species uh, when we incorporate that variability. So this is an example um, of oysters 
uh, where they were able to look at data of pH in the field um, in estuaries and then incorporate that into the design of their experiments where they have this deal fluctuation that is expected um, in those environments that the oysters are living. And when they incorporated that variation, you see uh, actually further um, detriment to their calcification processes when their fluctuations are uh, occurring in the experiment versus just a um, stable mean pH. Similarly, some of the early work um, that incorporated fluctuations uh, was done on um, algae that have uh, calcium carbonate. So uh, these algae can be really uh, susceptible to ocean and coastal acidification. Um, and then when fluctuations that are expected uh, in the environment that this algae lives really close to shore, um, is incorporated into the experiment based on values that were measured in the field. Uh, they see even further reduced gross growth in the fluctuating um, conditions compared to when we just expose them to static conditions. So really understanding that variability that those animals are actually experiencing can really help us make better predictions for how their growth and behavior and other physiological parameters um, are likely to be um, altered in a future ocean. I have also done work um, thinking about fluctuations um, in, uh, in particular in intertidal. Uh, conditions. So similar experiments with uh, my intertidal or tide pool snails um, and using data that I collect from monitoring the carbonate chemistry in tide pools versus subtidal to really uh, include that in my experimental design um, by fluctuating the pH um, in at each day of their exposure uh, to mimic tidal patterns. Um, and what we have found when we include that fluctuating pH is really that that low pH extremes that they experience is really going to modify um, how they respond to ocean acidification conditions. And then the last sort of example of how understanding that or monitoring the um, coastal near shore conditions um, can help us make better predictions is thinking about spatial heterogeneity and exposure of low pH or um, uh, reduced aragonite saturation, um, whatever parameter you are particularly interested in. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna highlight some of the work that was done on the West Coast in this uh, really great monitoring network um, where there was, um, CFETs placed in the inner tidal um, along the west coast um, of the U.S. Uh, that were placed for about five years. That allowed for a snapshot of thinking about the severity of pH exposure um, along that coast. Uh, and just um, one major takeaway from that monitoring was identifying sort of hot spots of exposure um, where there is um, sort of hot spots that are driven by coastal upwelling where this cold, uh, nutrient rich, but also, um, acidified water, um, gets upwelled onto the coast, um, and can expose the animals that live there, um, to more extreme acidification events. And this is, um, sort of persistent across the years that this was measured. Um, and so one thing is that we can then identify where these animals um, are maybe getting exposed to that persistent acidification, but it can also help us um, in the design of experiments that are thinking about local adaptation. So um, whether or not uh, certain animals might have sort of pre-adaptations that allow them to uh, be less vulnerable to these changes in the future. So I was able to sort of take advantage of that monitoring to do some of my experiments thinking about um, different uh, 
populations of intertidal snails and how they respond to uh, low pH exposure with the idea that um, sort of the northern populations might be less susceptible to change um, because they are pre-exposed um, to low pH conditions. And what we uh, have found so far is that there is differences in the response between populations, probably driven by their exposure to uh, sort of acidification events um, due to upwelling. This, uh, I'm not alone in these kinds of experiments. There are what um, have been in the last decades um, many experiments thinking about local adaptation that have utilized this monitoring network um, to really uh, have a baseline for thinking about where we might expect um, sort of less vulnerable populations to exist um, because we know something about that persistent exposure to um, ocean acidification conditions. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of three or four experiments, but there's been many more since um, this was published that are uh, thinking about local adaptation and whether or not we have populations that might um, be seed for uh, that species because they're less vulnerable to um, ocean acidification in the future because of this environmental history um, of exposure. And uh, a bit of a more recent review um, of this idea of incorporating environmental history when thinking um, about the responses to future coastal acidification um, has found that here white is a, a neutral effect um, of acidification, pink is a negative effect, and green is a positive effect. And the comparison here in A is really thinking about if you incorporate that environmental history and know something about how these animals might have been pre-exposed to acidification-like um, conditions, uh, when that is incorporated, we see less negative effects um, and more positive effects. So that can help us um, better predict what we might expect for um, biological responses in the future. So yeah, again, I just think uh, being able to understand what's happening really close to the shore where these animals um, find their home, uh, especially um, you know, invertebrate species that can be economically and uh, very ecologically important in this environment um, can really make for better predictions um, of how they will fare in future oceans because of these three main points, but lots of other reasons why um, that can be helpful as well. Um, and then, uh, and I saw that, Sam, I think you're on this call, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your last name um, incorrectly, but Sidlitsky um, at all 2021 um, identified uh, a bunch of the monitoring sites um, in the Gulf of Maine, um, both surface and subsurface monitoring, um, that I think gives us a really good idea of where we already have really um, near shore monitoring and where there's opportunity uh, for further monitoring um, in the near shore that could help us make better predictions. Um, in particular, I was not here yet um, on the East Coast when Shell Day happened. Um, but I think that's a really awesome snapshot um, of that geographic variability that may uh, exist um, really near shore in the Gulf of Maine. Um, and I would pitch that it would be awesome to have um, more monitoring like that and also long-term um, monitoring. Um, and the example on the right is uh, sort of a buoy that's more um, further offshore than the CML, the Coastal Marine Lab um, monitoring of P pH. So here we have aragonite saturation um, and this 1.5 is really um, identifying sort of a biological limit. Um, and you can see there is differences in what the animals living closer to shore um, near, near where I'm working um, that they're probably exposed to more corrosive conditions um, near shore than we would capture from um, monitoring um, even uh, a bit offshore from the CML site. 
And then I did, <laughs> I did answer all of the questions and happy to sort of go back to this slide and um, chat more about um, what I what I think would be um, my sort of ideal uh, scenario that would help for making predictions for uh, biological responses. Um, but I also just one want to also say that I think um, it's really important for us to monitor coastal acidification, but also within the framework of multiple stressors, because these animals are not just experiencing acidification in isolation. Um, and a lot of the work thinking about multiple stressors, whether it be ocean warming or um, deoxygenation or nutrient loading, have really um, shown that there is often synergistic effects of these multiple stressors that can influence the um, biological response of animals. But I think a uh, missing piece is really understanding when and where they coincide. So um, monitoring all of these types of stressors, I think, um, is going to be important in the future. And that's all I have. Brittany. Uh, so next up, we're going to hear from Hannes, Bo uh, Hannes Bowman. Uh, Hannes is a, an associate professor at the Department of Marine Sciences at the University of Connecticut. He has been leading the Evolutionary Fish Ecology Lab there for about nine years. A large focus is on experimental research on the climate sensitivity of marine organisms and the study of phenotypic and genotypic patterns of adaptation to spatial climate gradients. His lab has also started and maintained a monitoring time series of temperature, pH, and dissolved oxygen in a small eelgrass covered cove since 2015, documenting the naturally extreme environmental fluctuations in nearshore productive systems of the US Northeast. Take it away, Thomas. Thank you, Austin. I'll uh, let I let Emily share the screen. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, making time for this. Uh, as I said to Austin and Emily, this is a new thing for me. I'm attending a conference in Portugal, attending a conference via Zoom uh, here at Nikan. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a great thing to do. And uh, I believe that's a nice and important discussion. And I also think that uh, we heard the main points that I wanted to make in uh, in regard to the, the sampling already. So a good thing is that we are sort of like speaking with one voice here. And there isn't really a big disagreement as to what monitoring should focus about. Uh, you see a small uh, cove here. This is really close to uh, Groton, Connecticut, halfway between New York and Boston, uh, eastern Long Island Sound. And uh, this is a nearshore environment that is uh, characterized by uh, lots and lots of uh, eelgrass. And as we have uh, documented over the last uh, seven years, seven to eight years, uh, these eelgrass or subaquatic vegetation in general uh, modify the uh, the the amount of the carbon chemistry uh, emitted uh, immensely, and it's a very important sort of like habitat. Uh, if you go to the next slide, so I just wanted to plug this that we uh, have been doing this relatively uh, simple uh, operation here, just uh, unfunded, simply because we can and we have the the resources to drive a boat every five to six weeks uh, into that little cove swap these uh, sensors that are about 50 centimeters off the bottom in that in that cove and uh, the the water the, the the tide basically varies uh, above them and we've uh, basically uh, looked at this because i believe personally that monitoring is an important but uh, undervalued uh, societal service so it's something that has very little reward in the short term but it's probably very important in the long term so i support that Next slide. So I want to make this short because uh, my uh, two cents uh, to the monitoring uh, question is really the same as our speaker before. Uh, the most important decision or application for monitoring without, without, within our 
uh, theme of biological um, you know, importance. I'm a fisheries or a fish biologist. I um, lead the evolutionary fish ecology lab here. So our focus has been on the sensitivity of uh, fish species to ocean acidification. And the same thing applies uh, for fish and for invertebrates in some sense. And that is that at near shore environments, they are already experiencing a large uh, range of uh, fluctuations in CO2 and pH and oxygen to which they have, be, have to be adapted. So um, what, we, what we want to better understand and what we want to uh, monitoring to help us with is basically to uh, characterize these environments better because we do really not understand fully how, dif how different they are. So if you go to the next slide, I did this uh, a few years back for, you know, like a, a, a paper or invited conference paper. And I just thought a little bit more conceptually about it. The reality is undoubtedly more complicated, but if you really just focus on one axis of that, uh, that fluctuation, what uh, is obvious Obvious from the Hoffman paper, but from all of these other um, spatial measurements, is that we have a, a near shore to open ocean axis in CO2 fluctuations. So you can say that in the near shore environment, we have documented fluctuations, diel fluctuations in CO2 and seasonal or so short term variations between even below so 200 microatmospheres to almost 5,000 microatmospheres. It's really in productive, particularly salt marsh habitats. These are the, this is the range we are talking about that these organisms experience on a short-term diel to seasonal basis. And then you go uh, further offshore, so to the coastal environment, and these um, short-term fluctuations attenuate. And my uh, hypothesis that uh, seems to kind of, um, you know, like, at least I believe to that's what I see in the data that I'm, I, I, I look at is that the further you go out, the more stable, obviously, the, uh, the CO2 environment becomes. That has two consequences. The first is that the actual anthropogenic uh, ocean acidification signal becomes clearer and sort of like emerges from, from that, that large variability, that background variability. And if you find an organism that is basically adapted to that open ocean or coastal shelf, lower variability, then um, you are probably having a good chance to find an organism that is more sensitive to ocean acidification or to higher CO2 levels than if you are really looking at those very nearshore environments. For example, we have been studying a nearshore uh, fish called the Atlantic Silverside, which is affected by high CO2, but very, very, very little. So you can say that it's very highly tolerant. And we have um, now contrasted that with a study on, of a fish species that is more, you know, on the coastal shelf that is sort of adapted to a, a you know, lower, uh, you know, to lower variability. It's called uh, the, the sandlands or northern sandlands, which is much, 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 much more uh, CO2 sensitive. Same thing goes for uh, copepodes, other uh, uh, invertebrate species. So Christian Vargas in uh, Concepcion in Chile did uh, some phenomenal work published in 2017 and 2022, basically showing the same principle is true. The more variable the uh, environment is, the more tolerant these, these organisms are. Um, next. So we, we, we know that higher variability means higher tolerance. So I don't think this is so controversial. It's the same thing that uh, we, we heard before. But what we don't really, uh, what there's still considerable, at least for the fish world, considerable sort of like uncertainty about is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or is if these vari if the variability gets, gets bigger, basically, does that have any negative effects? Uh, my lab has uh, done some work on Atlantic silver sites, and basically after we fluctuated the environment and the experiments in, uh, you know, in a very systematic way, 
we concluded that the data showed us that these uh, fluctuations provide a physiological refuge uh, to early life stages to these silver sites in a congener uh, just just uh, on the other side of Long Island uh, on in, in, in Stony Brook, uh, uh, Brook Morel and uh, Chris Gobler, they did an experiment that concluded just the opposite. So you can see that uh, there isn't really a consensus yet whether these uh, fluctuations, whether when, if, if and when they become in the future more extreme, are actually a good thing or a bad thing. Next. So question, the question is for, for this particular working group and as a, as a resource is like, what should, we, what should we monitoring? Are we already doing what we need to do? Uh, what should basically uh, be done differently? And does it require any additional parameters to be monitored? And I think when it comes to fish or organisms, we are already, I believe, monitoring the most important uh, parameters that there are. So when you're talking about non-calcifying organisms like, um, like, like fish or other, uh, other species or other groups, temperature, salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen are really the important uh, uh, parts, the important parameters that you need. Yes, when you are talking about calcifying organisms, you probably are um, you you want to know uh, alkalinity. I know that uh, there's a there's definite there's definitely an increasing interest in uh, understanding uh, how uh, total alkalinity, in addition to pH and other uh, parameters, is is changing and how it what it has effect, particularly in calcifiers like uh, shellfish, uh, PCO two, and also fluorescence to get a better understanding about the uh, primary productivity are certainly parameters that would help particularly to gauge the impact on calcifying uh, organisms. But what I want to pitch here is uh, when we are not like in a very shallow area, but sort of like a little bit more in, uh, in, in shelf waters, we are often constrained in uh, measurements of um, uh, waters of surface waters or so surface temperatures, surface pH. Surface, we, we basically have buoys often that are um, taking these measurements and what we are missing, what is, a, however, biological, very uh, important and probably a critical monitoring need are the conditions on the, on the bottom or close to the bottom. There's a lot of life going on close to the bottom. Eggs are being deposited on the bottom. There is um, fish swimming around on the bottom. There's, uh, there's worms you know, sort of like crawling around on the bottom. There's a whole microorganism community that is associated with the sediment. And the idea that a, uh, a measurement in the water column is even, even representative or can even tell us something about what um, any organisms that are on the seafloor experience is, is probably not true. So we need at least some more process studies that uh, show us how the difference between the uh, water column and the bottom is. Next. Um, a little provocative, forget about the open ocean. Uh, of course, we cannot forget about the open ocean. But if you talk about organisms, then you have to say that the most of that, that what what humans care about sort of the 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 commercial species the commercial fish species the, the all the, the the organisms the most of these organisms that we actually sort of like care about and their productivity and their well-being and the, the, the resiliency of these ecosystems that's happening on the uh, on the continental shelf water so this is where really most of our focus should probably be uh, the, the the coastal shelf and then into the near shore areas as we just heard and where where nursery uh, habitats are uh, important for for organisms that are basically using them on a seasonal basis so don't forget about the open ocean but in the grand scheme of things most marine organisms are living in coastal and continental shelf waters so that is actually coinciding i believe pretty well with uh the logistical feasibility of monitoring because that's where we actually can put uh, sensors most conveniently into the water. Next. 
how often should we uh, require these uh, observations so sort of uh, what seasons are critical and uh, what are the frequencies that's very important question sort of to gauge the uh, uh, important effort that we need to do i would my two cents i would say that the productive seasons are most important we know from uh, work that we've done all over the United States and estuaries and, and uh, shallow environments, we know that uh, during these uh, summer uh, and fall productive seasons, that's when we have the biggest uh, amplitudes in pH and in oxygen fluctuations. That's when really the, the extremes are, are happening. The unproductive, often winter seasons are uh, where fewer species, the mobile species, basically evade the, the, the habitats and uh, uh, migrate out to the shelf, say, and where uh, the pH levels in the environment are more stable. So if you, if you really have to pick a season, then again, it's probably a neat thing that the warm seasons are the most important ones, because who wants to take out the boat in winter? Um, seasonal fluctuations, uh, that's, that's still really something that uh, I, I believe is an important question. Are these seasonal fluctuations getting more extreme, seasonal PCO2 fluctuations? Uh, if you just quickly go to the next slide, we, we did this um, uh, just, just a year ago. We, we published a paper on uh, the CO2 sensitivity of that uh, of embryos of the sandlands embryos that's you know a very sort of like busy figure here the the the, the panel a is a, a model output uh, from sam's basically uh, model exercise that we then took uh, to uh, a, a step further and then predicted basically uh, pco2 conditions for the year 2050 and for the year 2100 at the same time we had experimental uh, just experiments, CO two exposure experiments on these uh, on these sandlands embryos that are very very sensitive to high CO two, so we can get some kind of response uh, from this, and uh, that shows that just from ocean acidification alone, you know, like at the year two thousand one hundred, these uh, fish would basically the, the the hatching success would be reduced to about seventy percent uh, of what it is today. But what struck me about these uh, modeling exercises, and maybe it's because I'm a, I'm a biologist and I'm not so steeped in the modeling literature, but um, I, was, I was really, really surprised and, and taken aback by how much the seasonal fluctuations in, uh, in predicted CO2 are intensifying over the course of the century. So you can see that um, by the year 2100, we are talking about you know, more than 300 ppms or, or microatmospheres from between the sort of like fall low and then the, the, the late uh, winter, early spring uh, high in, uh, in PCO2. And, and that's much, much more extreme than uh, it is. Uh, it is even in the year predicted year 2015 and what it is now. So uh, organisms certainly have to uh, we have to think about that organisms not just uh, need to adapt to a higher PCO2 level, but to a higher seasonal fluctuation in PCO2. Next. Uh, I think I wanted to make, can, can you go to back? Yes. Okay, the yield variability, I think honestly, that we we kind of understand that it, it, it changes every i don't think that we need to uh, really have such a high variability in monitoring the seasonal fluctuations are important the diel fluctuations that's probably a contentious statement if i say that honestly once we know how large that magnitude can be the you know like continuous high frequency monitoring to me is uh, uh, less important. I don't think we can. We there's a critical need to 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 do this. They say like every ten minutes or every twenty minutes or something like that. I agree um, that the spatial variability is much more important than that high frequency temporal. So instead of having one probe that 
really like free samples every five minutes, it's more important to have 10 probes that sample once a day uh, or twice a day or something like that. And uh, when we talk about precision of these pH measurements as they are currently occurring, so our pH probes, our common pH probes have a, a accuracy and precision of about 0 0.1 pH uh, units. Honestly, when we're talking about our nearshore or coastal shelf processes where we sometimes see pH fluctuating by one whole pH unit, that's that's okay. That's enough. Uh, I, I believe the current measurement precision for organisms and the applications that we're talking about here is sufficient. All right, let's just go to to advance. So uh, in 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 conclusion, I think let's let's try and uh, put it into our heads that we also need to uh, monitor bottom waters. It would be a very important critical uh, monitoring need. And I think I have one more slide, right? Oh, no, I have one, one more slide that says we need cheaper and more reliable pH sensors because uh, half of the gray hairs are from my kids and the other half of the gray hairs I have uh, are from pH sensors. They are um, they're drifting, they're unreliable, and even the ones that are costing $300 more than the others are, are not much better than that. So we need cheaper and more reliable pH sensors. I think there is a, uh, a good development underway already to, uh, to, to do so. All right, last slide. That's uh, just me uh, playing around with MATLAB and uh, showing you how uh, pH conditions in uh, July 2022, like last year, you know, change in Mumford Cove. Uh, it might be a little, uh, yeah, not, not, not very, very fluent, but that's that's what we're talking about in that um, eel, uh, eel grass covered uh, bay just uh, close to our institute. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thomas. That was that was a great presentation. Um, up next. We are going to be hearing from Shrekim Goez. Shrekim is a biological oceanographer whose research is focused on understanding carbon cycling in the oceans and the structure and functioning of plankton eco ecosystems as they respond to global warming and climate change, ocean acidification, and hypoxia. For his research, he relies on an approach that examines marine planktonic organisms at a cellular level where changes in cell physiology, biochemistry, and optical properties are studied as a means of evaluating their role and response to episodic and long-term changes in the environment. Information obtained at the cellular level is then extrapolated to regional and global scales using data from satellites and coupled with biophysical models. Shakim holds a master's degree from Bombay University in India and a doctorate degree from Nagoya University in Japan. He worked at the National Institute of Oceanography in Goa, India, and the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine. Prior to his current position as a Lamont Research Professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory Climate School in Columbia University, New York. Please take it away. The introduction. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slides. And can you hear me? Can you, we can hear you perfectly. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about. Um, I didn't answer the questions and I apologize for that. I was a little bit tied up with the cruise that I'm going on. Um, but today, what I would like to uh, emphasize in my talk is the need uh, for more um, high resolution kind of measurements uh, at um, the base of the food chain and that is monitoring phytoplankton. And what I want to uh, say here is that with a little effort, uh, this can be added on to any monitoring program. 
And uh, my first uh, cruise uh, on an ocean acidification cruise was actually on the East Coast Ocean Acidification 2. And I realized then uh, that there was uh, no one monitoring phytoplankton um, physiology or phytoplankton uh, physiological distribution. So this work, I'm grateful to Joe Salisbury from um, UNH who actually invited me on this ECOA 2 cruise and uh, this work uh, was really um, um, a piece of work that helped me uh, realize that I should get on to the next few cruises that um, the East Coast Ocean Acidification Program might have. So I participated in the East Coast Ocean Acidification Cruise of uh, three, which was uh, last year. And I'll show you uh, results uh, from just two. So I'll preface my talk with this little, um, for over half a century, oceanographers have assumed that terrestrial plants may be CO2 limited while marine phytoplankton are not. And increasing the CO2 in the ocean from anthropogenic fossil fuel combustion would have little to no effect on marine plant production. Today, um, as because of the work done since the 1990s. We realize now uh, that um, the CO2 in the water, in seawater does have a huge impact on phytoplankton. But yet today's uh, food web models really do not include any organic carbon as a regulating factor of marine primary productivity. And currently there have been very few attempts to investigate this uh, relationship over large temporal and spatial scales. So uh, I'm going to take off where Hans and Brittany left. Uh, Hans mentioned um, that the coastal environments are the ones that are subject to uh, the biggest changes in carbonate chemistry over the course of a day and over season. And uh, um, my message is um, that phytoplankton um, respond really fast to these changes um, that occur um, over dial cycle in coastal waters because of their short generation times and their dependence on CO2 for photosynthesis and growth. So my questions today are, does the variability of carbon Cabinet chemistry have a significant influence on the distribution of and community structure of phytoplankton functional types. And do phytoplankton residing in low or high CO2 water, CO2 waters have special physiological characteristics that allow them to outcompete other phytoplankton? So I'll start with this work that got me interested in the East Coast um, ocean acidification and my pitch for joining these cruises. So in 2010, um, I participated on this cruise called Anacondas. Uh, it was led by T. Shager of, um, from University of Georgia. And uh, this cruise actually transacted the uh, Amazon River plume as it exited out from the Amazon River into the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I had an instrument on board called uh, Alpha. It's a fluorescence-based uh, instrument. And it helps you identify um, uh, phytoplankton biomass and the distribution of three different kinds of species. And what you see as P1, P2, and P3 are nothing but open ocean cyanobacteria. Um, P2 is coastal ocean cyanobacteria, and P3 is uh, cryptophytes. And what you see here is that. But at the mouth of the river, obviously, the chlorophyll concentrations were very, very high. And this was a region where the PCO2 concentrations were very, very low as well. But if you look at the species distributions of uh, the blue cyanobacteria, like trichodesmin or, uh, you know, diatom diazotroph uh, associations, or synecococcus, you, we saw that the distribution was far away from the mouth where, uh, and in waters that were had slight, slightly higher uh, PCO2 concentrations. And then this PCO, uh, P2, which are the coastal cyanobacteria, were concentrated near the mouth of the river and somewhere around here. And P3, which is cryptophytes, were concentrated very close to the mouth of the river. 
Um, and here is a distribution of salinity and PCO2. You can see the PCO2 concentrations are very, very low uh, because of the drawdown uh, by phytoplankton um, of this uh, CO2 in the water uh, due to photosynthesis. But you also saw that um, as you moved offshore, the PCO2 concentrations uh, became really high. Now, um, I started pulling the data that we collected on board. And one of the things that jumped out was that the diatoms had their highest concentrations in a area that had the lowest PCO2 concentrations. And this diatom diazotroph associations, these are uh, diatoms that contain um, a cyanobacterial population within them. Um, and uh, their concentrations were higher off the coast um, in the offshore waters. And then we had uh, scattered um, filaments of trichodesmin all over the place. Um, so what you can see, um, uh, data from three, three different cruises uh, that uh, followed the first cruise in 2010. We had a cruise in 2011 and 2012. And you can see the distribution of uh, PCO2. And uh, you can see the distribution of diatoms. And you can see that the diatoms are very high where the PCO2 concentrations are low. You can see it happening for all three years. And just an XY plot showing the distribution of uh, diatoms, uh, diatom diazotroph associations or trichodesmine showed that indeed um, at low um, PCO2 concentrations, you had uh, less than 400, you had diatoms. Uh, diatom diazotroph associations occupied a very narrow niche between 300 to 400 uh, uh, parts per million. And then uh, trichodesmine. Uh, really tolerate the highest CO2 concentrations. And uh, I won't go into this slide, but it does show um, you where the CO2 concentrations and the distribution of chlorophyll um, match with what uh, CO2 concentrations that we were seeing on uh, the 2010, 2011, and 2012 cruises. So, um, yeah, I'll skip this slide as well. Um, but here's what I wanted to, um, there was a person on board who was doing the metatranscriptomics of uh, whole water samples. And I extracted some data from his data set. And what we did see um, that this carbonic anhydrases were highest um, uh, in the, uh, close to the river mouth where the CO2 concentrations were very low and diatoms were predominant. And I will just show you along this axis um, that the number of diatoms um, were highest at low salinities and where the CO2, PCO2 concentrations were the lowest. Uh, this is the number of diatom genes, which is consistent with what we were seeing in the flow cam counts and also in our other data sets that we had, the microscopy. And what you also saw was this carbonic anhydrase was very high in um, low CO2 waters. So um, we, in 2013, we did some experiments in the lab and we started looking at uh, how uh, different phytoplankton responded to different concentrations of um, PCO2. And here you see um, roughly that um, diatoms actually tend to grow faster in low CO2, PCO2 waters. And um, if you see this uh, diatom diazotroph association hemiolus alkai, which we had, um, you can see um, that it did really well at uh, PCO2 concentrations of about 400 which is consistent with what I showed in that XY plot, where DDA is occupied a narrow niche between 300 to 400 ppm. And they did not do well at um, low CO2 concentrations. And if you look at this um, uh, organism, Hemiolis hawkeye, under the microscope, you can see 
their population of Rickelia, um, the cyanobacteria within them was did look best at 400 ppm, but at low concentrations of CO2 and high concentrations, it didn't do well. And this is for tri trichodesmium. You could see that it did well at 400 and also at 800 ppm, but at low PCO2 concentrations, uh, it didn't do well. So my point is that uh, although um, these are natural um, environment uh, experiments uh, combined with laboratory field experiments, and this gives us complete confidence that PCO2 concentrations indeed affect the base of the food chain, and it would affect uh, hydrotrophic levels and the food that we draw from the oceans. So this brings me um, in to the East Coast Ocean Acidification 2 uh, cruise that I participated. And again, as I said, uh, uh, it, this was such a wonderful opportunity for me because we had um, uh, the top brass of the carbonate chemistry world on board. And um, this is the data that was collected, um, alkalinity pH and DIC. And what you can immediately see is there is a sort of a north um, south gradient in the ocean acidification. And I, I have plotted this on um, this axis over here. And you can see uh, as you move from north to south, there's a beautiful gradient that we see in um, pH. And it tapers off uh, at around 35 and then becomes constant as we get into the Gulf Stream. But you see that DIC is higher as you go down south and it's lower in the Gulf of Maine region. What you do also see is this chlorophyll concentrations are very, very high, consistent with what we saw at the Amazon, uh, in the Amazon River. And here is uh, the distribution of um, different phytoplankton groups. You can see diatoms were highest in the Gulf of Maine region where you had uh, those PCO2 concentrations. And again, you see this distribution of uh, cyanobacteria, blue water cyanobacteria, coastal water cyanobacteria, and cryptophytes, uh, which is consistent with what we saw in the Amazon River plume as well. And again, uh, this is this data from the flow cam. Uh, just to give you an idea that this area was rich with diatoms and dinoflagellates. But as you got down south, it was full of uh, either trichodesmium, and the further south you went, you had uh, synecococcus and other microorganisms. So my uh, so pitch uh, is that um, you know uh, having these instruments on board gives you an uh, an easy way to see how the base of the food chain is changing as a result of this ocean acidification conditions. And there's so much data that you can get from this flow through system that we have developed uh, that can be put on any research vessel. And you can get the distribution of phytoplankton very easily. So in this case, you can see um, the cyanobacteria were higher down south. Um, and as you went further down south, it became lower. But you can see this coastal cyanobacteria were highest in the high PCO, uh, low PCO2 region of the Gulf of Maine, Maine region, so were cryptophytes. So um, in summary, uh, I would like to say that carbon carbonate chemistry has a significant dis uh, influence on the distribution of phytoplankton type. And uh, phytoplankton residing in low PCO2 waters have special carbon concentrating mechanisms. And as I showed the transcriptomic data showing high concentration of carbonic anhydrase, that is what allows them to outcompete other phytoplankton in low PCO2 waters. So um, elevated PCO2 concentration uh, result in down uh, regulation of this carbon carbonate concentration uh, enzymes in diazotrophs um, and, and other phytoplankton groups, and thereby stimulates their growth and nitrogen fixation. So, so what I want to say in, uh, finally is that all ocean acidification programs need to include phytoplankton, because not only does uh, um, 
carbonate chemistry affect phytoplankton concentrations or phytoplankton community structure, but phytoplankton themselves have a huge impact on the carbonate chemistry. Thank, thank you. That was my last slide, thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move forward and open up the floor to questions from the steering committee. Hey, Austin, if you could maybe stop sharing, or I guess it's uh, Jakeem who's sharing, sharing his screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. The presentation down. Yeah, I'll there see. we go. Now I can see all the faces. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ivy Melson. I'm a biologist with uh, EPA Region 1, and I'm going to moderate our discussion from uh, after today's uh, presentations. Thank you to all of the speakers. It was really interesting, and I definitely learned a lot uh, over this last hour. Um, I guess I will start us off by uh, asking some of the questions that our steering committee members have um, put into a document. If those uh, steer NECAN steering committee members want to, uh, you know, come on camera, raise your hand if you want to clarify your question or respond, uh, uh, have a follow-up question to the presenter's response, then I'm happy to um, facilitate those interactions. Um, so kind of like a, a broad question that maybe multiple of you folks could, could answer is generally what, what sort of monitoring might be needed to support adaptation studies? You know, are we, have we observed, um, organisms that are adapting to increased ocean acidification? And what biological observations in particular do we need to be making in order to, um, to gain that understanding? Well, it's, it's interesting you ask. I mean, I'm, I'm right now at a place where somebody is talking about adaptation to uh, OA, the higher, the higher CO2 levels in the Baltic Sea compared to, say, the uh, uh, North Atlantic Ocean. The specific example is cod. Um, the Baltic Sea has much higher CO2 uh, levels, probably because of eutrophication. And uh, the cod has definitely adapted to it. So when you are putting basically a little uh, fish larvae, a little cod larvae into a beaker, and you are exposing them to, say, 2,000 microatmospheres, the ones in the, from the Baltic Sea, they just laugh at you. And the ones from the Barents Sea, they die. That's the, the gist of the story. And um, so there's definitely adaptation going on. I believe, for example, closer to home here in Long Island Sound, we have this natural laboratory of uh, being basically a highly eutrophic uh, uh, environment with um, high, seasonal hypoxia and acidification, the, the coastal acidification in the West. And then more to the East, you have that gradient towards uh, sort of more oceanic and, and less eutrophic conditions. And I'm, I'm convinced that we would find, if we would look closely, um, organisms that are adapted to that gradient. Thank you for that response, Hans. Do any of the other presenters want to weigh in on that question? Yeah, I would just follow up that I think uh, it it depends sort of on the organism in particular and sort of their dispersal patterns um, for whether or not you might expect local adaptation. Um, and then in combination with what, how strong is the selective pressure? So if we can identify locations that have like a strong persistent difference in carbonate chemistry, I think those would be the locations to look. And then thinking about the animals um, that are living there, finding those that are like, you know, in terms of invertebrates, maybe ones that are brooders that have like crawl away individuals. So the dispersal is much um, lower, the capacity for dispersal. And so you might have more opportunity to find local adaptation in that way um, versus something that has like, you know, a month long dispersal, uh, um, larval dispersal, maybe those would not be the, the species that we would expect to have 
more local adaptation, especially in terms of carbonate chemistry. But I think key is, is also knowing, knowing what they're experiencing and is, is it a really strong, persistent selective pressure? So that's where the monitoring I think comes in. Do we yeah, know this for, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay, go ahead, Hans, uh, I'll speak up to you. I just want to pose the question, if we know of a persistent sort of like uh, gradient in the Gulf of Maine, uh, that is not just from the near shore to the more offshore, but there are areas in the Gulf of Maine, perhaps. I really don't know. I would like to know if there are known gradients in there in, say, pH or um, CO2. Yeah, I, I was going to add, um, uh, Hans, I, I could probably look at that very closely based on the data that we've collected uh, during the East Coast Ocean Acidification Program 2 and 3, and I could uh, let you know probably within about two or three months whether there were some gradients. Uh, but I, I, what I want to emphasize again is that um, you have these tiny organisms at the base of the food chain that have the physiological plus city to adapt, uh, but they don't survive for too long if, um, you know, those extreme conditions persist for a long time. And so you have a population uh, that is less adapted, that slowly fades up from that ecosystem. Uh, we have seen this happening elsewhere in the Arabian Sea, for instance, where uh, low pH, uh, low CO2 concentrations have led to the emergence of a completely new organism called Octoluca scintillans. And I think we do see this also in the in Long Island Sound, which you mentioned. Uh, during certain years, when you have um, uh, the uh, hypoxic zone expand um, and manifest at the surface, you do see a different kind of population in summer than in a normal year. And I think this has a cascading effect on other organisms in the food chain. Thank you all. Those are some really helpful insights. Um, so speaking of variability, um, have we tried to conduct intertidal monitoring on the East Coast? Our drivers here are a little bit different than the West Coast. Uh, Brittany, this uh, question is directed towards you. Um, and would we expect um, a lot more like small scale variability in our systems here? Um, and are the, is there going to be different organism response in those different systems? So, um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll let you respond to that. That's a great question that I don't know if I know the answer to, um, because I, like I said, I'm fairly new and still trying to sort of understand them, especially like the monitoring, um, that's going on across because there's lots of sort of snapshots um, and then, you know, like longer term, term like buoy data. Um, as far as I know, there's not a lot going on in terms of really close to shore, like intertidal and tide pool um, chemistry. I, I hope that my lab will sort of pick that up um, at least on like a local scale. Um, but I think uh, what we have found when when we measure chemistry in a tide pool that's isolated, the biomass of like photosynthesizers versus respire, those organisms that respire plays a huge role in the variability um, that you see, as well as the size of the tide pool. Um, and so I think there's there's possible uh, possibility that we would see similar, um, fluctuations, at least on a deal and like tidal scale um, here, like we see in the West Coast when thinking about tide pools. Um, when we're thinking about non-tide pools and just like close to shore, um, on the West Coast, a major driver is upwelling. Um, and we do have upwelling here, but not in the same sort of um, extremes um, that you see on the West Coast. And so I think there's um, other drivers um, that would play a larger role, um, like freshwater input, um, 
and have more like these event episodic events that can get that extreme low um, that we see with upwelling. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Um, so Hans, you've advocated for uh, like a wide spatial distribution of our monitoring efforts in order to gain an understanding of our nearshore variability. Um, however, as you know, and as everyone on this webinar probably is familiar with, um, that's very, it can be resource intensive to monitor. Um, and doing this, the spatially distributed yeah, monitoring is, is harder to do resource wise than fixed location monitoring. So do you have any suggestions on how to bridge the gap between having um, increased fixed location monitoring stations that cost more and like kind of folding in this problem or challenge of having such a variable um, intertidal system here on the East Coast selecting where to put those um, those long-term deployments? I think my only suggestion would be to uh, look at types of habitats and, uh, and, and characterize that way. We can, of course, you know, go smaller and smaller and smaller and say that my salt marsh is different from your salt marsh. But if it's a if it's like a, a salt marsh in, in a in a you know temperate latitude, then maybe we should have you know a, an example of that and be very and, and understand that very well. And uh, we have we should have a rocky uh, intertidal or in a number of this, but we we don't need to go everywhere uh, all all over the place. But we should have the the relevant habitats. Uh, we should we should basically cover. And I'm saying this because I, I used to be a postdoc uh, in, in Stony Brook and we did a lot of work in Flax Pond, small um, little uh, salt marsh embayment, muddy bottom um, and much really extreme uh, day and night and summer winter fluctuations there in uh, pH and CO2 and uh, temperature. And now I'm, uh, I'm looking really very close it's not even it's not even 100 miles uh, apart so same same latitude same long island sound but we are now looking at a cove that has eelgrass in the bottom and it's just absolutely mind blowing how different the carbon chemistry is the the, the super saturation in oxygen during during um, you know like afternoon hours in 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 in, in summer and is 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 absolutely surpri not surprising to people who understand something about it but to me who who didn't know much about it before we we see we see pco2 or calculate pco2 concentrations that are really under 200 uh, microatmospheres and the ph uh, lows are much 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 more subdued so uh, i think we should we should have we should uh, have monitoring that uh, takes that covers different habitat types better. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple of questions regarding um, equipment and being in the in the field monitoring. Um, Jakim. Uh, a question for you regarding um, phytoplankton monitoring on vessels. Do those flow, flow through monitoring systems require having a scientist on board or could it be added to a ferry or a fishing vessel and operated by a non-scientist? So, a person running them on board. Um, but it would help to have someone on board if you have something like a flow cam, for instance. But the other instruments don't require a person on board. Yeah. So that's a potential opportunity, I guess, to leverage some additional um, flow through. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, follow up question why might it be? important to conduct this nearshore monitoring of phytoplankton using um, uh, volunteer uh, vessels such as ferries or fishing vessels? Yes, so uh, we do um, some work with the Connecticut DEP in Long Island Sound. 
And we have our instruments on just small boats, so it can operate even out of small boats. That's great. Um, and Brittany and Hans, are you dealing with biofouling on your sensors and near shore environments that are there for long term? Yes, yes, we do, we, we do, we do. I, I have this this probe that's called, you know, it's it's a Manta probe. Uh, we bring it out in say July, and we we bring it back in in uh, four weeks later, and we have like thumbnail sized barnacles on it in four weeks. Um, and if we wouldn't cover our sensors in a double layer of copper mesh they would be they would be completely covered in an organism so the only way we can we can monitor this is by protecting the sensors in copper mesh how about you Brittany? yeah same same thing um some of my stuff has just been using uh like post calibration of ysi um ns NBS measurements um, with bottle samples. So in that case, it's not like keeping it out in the field, um, which helps with not getting biofouling. Um, but in the case of using CFETs, uh, yeah, lots of issues with biofouling. And that's one of the major like um, sort of people power uh, issue of like having to go out and, and um, clean that, but also the bottle samples involved as well. Um, there is a an, a nice paper by um, Emily Rivest, uh, in particular, thinking about biofouling and um, other issues of um, data quality for those kinds of measurements with those kind of SONs and things um, that uh, I have found to be particularly helpful in thinking of like data quality. Yeah, thanks, Brittany. That's a an important point and question that was raised uh, by our steering committee as well as yeah, wondering the alternative what... the alternative to to protecting it with copper would be to wipe it i don't know if anybody is using a, a ph sensor with a wiper I, I i personally don't but it probably exists is that effective i i know a couple of people who are using ysi exosons with wipers and they they say that they work pretty well yeah, I think so. They're, but they're leaving theirs out for a few weeks or something before they kind of recover and clean them off as opposed to months and months out in the field. Yeah, I also do four, four, four to five weeks. That's that's my, yeah. my interval. Yeah, so they've been pretty happy with the wipers on the YSIs. But that's, you know, it's going to add some cost and stuff too. Right. Um, um, can, can I ask a question that's kind of... Uh, it bounces off of something that Hans said, but directed towards Brittany. So, so Hans kind of made the point that, you know, commercially available technology, sensor technology is kind of okay and good enough for doing um, some of these uh, analyses that we might want to do in sort of near shore estuarine environments. Would you agree, Brittany, for doing intertidal stuff? I mean, can you, are you comfortable? You said, you know, some studies have used Durafets, which are kind of a next level uh in terms of um cost would you agree that for intertidal stuff you can sort of do what you want to do with more commercially available stuff or do you need to go to the more precise more higher accuracy sensors i would agree i think that uh we're dealing with uh, again like huge swings yeah. um as well and so like you might not be able to get the specific um, offset or like the true true value, right? But you're going to get those magnitudes and and be able to understand that variability using um, sort of the lower end of the of the commercially available sensors. Um, of course, I you know would love to have like super high frequency, <laughs> like a high quality data, but that's just you know. Um, probably not feasible on the long long term. Great. Thanks, Chris, for popping in with a question. Does anyone else want to either unmute or turn on their camera and chime into the conversation? Beth, yeah, please. 
Yeah, um, great talks, everybody. This was really fabulous. Um, so I had a question for Brittany. Um, well, I have two questions, actually. The first is um, your experiments manipulated pH. And do you think that your um, conclusions would be any different if you analyze them with regard to omega instead of pH? That's a good question. Um, in regards to the like behavioral experiments, I don't think so because we, we sort of did it in terms of pH. Um, we could have done it PCO2, but really thinking about um, that being more of the mechanism um, that it's like an acid base balance or potentially an effect on the Q itself or receptors um, that's being driven by those things. So I think it it's sort of thinking about the mechanism that I might expect, but yes, in regards to more like recent work that I've been doing, thinking about calcification, I think in those experiments, I'm, I'm also considering Omega. Mm -hmm. And just um, personal curiosity, um, what are your plans? Um, where are you going to be? And, you know, what are you going to be doing in the next um, couple of years? <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully staying at UNH, <laughs> hopefully uh, collaborating with uh, Chris, um, thinking about, you know, monitoring and also like effects um, of ocean acidification. I have a um, graduate student this summer that's going to be doing um, similar behavioral work that I've done previously, but um, with lobsters um and their response to predator cues um which will be fun and i think um something that hasn't been done in that system uh or at least not published on we're following up on some some um, previous grad students work uh yeah and i'm really interested in multiple stressors um so you know continuing that um, work as well and trophic interactions um yeah hoping to to continue working on uh you know, not everybody thinks charismatic, charismatic, uh, small animals, but I think they are. And so <laughs> I hope we keep working on like mussels and, um, snails and, uh, also lobsters. So yeah. Thanks for Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'll, well, I'll throw in a, exciting. I'll throw in a plug that, um, Brittany is setting up a really, really interesting looking seawater manipulation experimental system at our coastal marine lab that'll and Brittany you can say more because you know way more about it than I do but um, it's going to offer some really um, exciting opportunities to do some tests of species responses to multi-stressors like she said before so I'm really excited to see how that comes together and the data that starts coming out of it. Yeah and one thing that's um, I mean those systems you probably know honest too is they like there's always issues with manipulating things even in the lab, um, but uh, it's going to be a flow through, which will be um, pretty great. Uh, and also um, each tank will be able to um, manipulate individually. Um, and so that will be fun. We can maybe think about fluctuations again um, and sort of patterning them that based on what we have at least as close to shore as we can get um, data. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that'll be cool. Um, and it's a 20 tank system. So, and I'm also That's very nice. happy to collaborate with people, um, in different places and think about questions in this, uh, realm. So, um, yeah, that's a plug. <laughs> if you're, if you're, if you're okay. in, involved in that, I would love to, you know, collaborate and work on those kinds of questions. So. Yeah, I would love to see it. And uh, if you, if you want to, if it's sort of like about to be finished, I would love to come up and uh, and and just just I, I'm interested in how people are going about it. None of these systems is the same. It's amazing, you know. Like we are, we're still there's still a lot of improvising uh, involved because you can't just buy something off the shelf with this with what we want to do. Um, I helped our colleagues at BIOS at Bermuda to do a flow through a CO2 system, and. You know, I'm just interested uh, how are you going about it. Thank Emma, you. didn't you did you also not uh, have a monitoring uh, in in Long Island Sound? Are you are you are you listening, Emma? Hi. 
Yes, um, I actually am mainly monitoring up in uh, Martha's Vineyard. Um, oh. I have yet to, um, I have a seining site in Morris Cove, but I'm yet to get um, a probe out there that's doing continuous monitoring, uh, just running into issues uh, with getting something deployed there that stays underwater. <laughs> um, and yeah, but we've um, been doing some Monitoring up in Martha's Vineyard with the same uh, mount of probes um, that uh, we were using in your lab, Hannah's. Um, and I'm also building um, a similar setup, Brittany. Um, I don't have a flow through system. Um, it's a closed circuit system, but also doing uh, fluctuating and multi stressor stuff. So, yeah, I'd love to touch base on picking your awesome. brain. Awesome. On uh, what kinds of animals, fish or inverts or? Yeah, so I was a postdoc in Hannes's lab. Um, I'm now an assistant professor at Southern Connecticut State University. So kind of on the more to the Western side of Long Island Sound. Um, and I'm basically um, in the later stages of building my system of trying to make it very versatile. So um, yeah, hopefully gonna be doing some uh, fish stuff, but also um, previous to my postdoc with Hannes uh, back in the UK, I was also doing some shellfish work. Um, and I've also branched into seaweed. So I'm kind of a bit of a jack of all trades, really. So <laughs> seaweed oh, nice. all the way up to sort of coastal forage fish. So. Well, congrats on the new position and building a system. It is a lot. <laughs> a easy task, yeah. <laughs> I love all of the collaborative conversation that's happening here. I do want to note we're a few minutes past our uh, determined end time here. Um, however, I want to give our steering committee one more chance to weigh in with final thoughts or questions before I um, hand it over to Austin to wrap us up. All right, I guess we uh, Well, to... sorry. Oh, I mean, yeah, no, that's sorry. Um, I have one last question for Joaquim just uh, that came to mind as I was listening to his talk, which I, I really liked a lot. But you show this sort of nice correlation you had some plots of latitude versus different uh, phytoplankton species distributions and carbonate chemistry. Um, and so how do you kind of deconvolve the fact that along the East Coast where the ECOA cruise goes, there's, you know, this natural gradient in carbonate chemistry, but also in, you know, like temperature and salinity. And it's, it must be hard to deconvolve those factors from the carbonate chemistry effects. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about how you might do that. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Amazon storms we have done that, um, um, and to test like principal component analysis uh, okay. reveal much better information than uh, simple correlations. So um, hopefully, uh, for this course, we'll be doing something similar and uh, be able to try and pinpoint what is uh, whether it's nutrients um, that are co-driving uh, the changes that we see or something else. That's a good question. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Thank you for your talk. Um, before we go, uh, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar was recorded and will be available on the NECANT website, and that our next webinar is this Wednesday, May 10th, from 1.30 to 3, so I'll see you all there. And then in addition, I want to remind everyone that after the webinar on Wednesday, there'll be a fairly large break, and the webinar is, will pick up again on July 18th. And finally, I just want to say thank you again to Brittany, Hannes, and Shaquem uh, for your presentations. And thanks to everyone else that joined us today. And have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.